Thanks for joining us. Well, it's just weeks. Well, that's all the time the intelligence community says it would take for Iran to make a nuclear bomb. The Islamic regime has already unveiled new long-range missiles that it claims can reach Israel. The Biden administration says the window is closing to reach a deal with Iran, and it's making risky concessions to get that deal done. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. One senator called the latest estimate on Iran's timeline for a nuclear weapon sobering and shocking. The White House argues it increases the urgency for the nuclear talks in Vienna. Our talks with Iran have reached an urgent point on mutual return to full implementation of the JCPOA, a deal that addresses the core concerns of all sides is in sight, but if it is not reached in the, un in the coming weeks, Iran's ongoing nuclear advances will make it impossible for us to return to the JCPOA. Critics warn the Biden administration is giving up too much in its pursuit of a deal. Ben and Ben Talibu of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy says for more than a year, the White House has been giving into Iran. I think the Biden administration is rushing and building this case for a, an urgent need for a deal off of a year of premature concessions, which we saw through indirect sanctions relief, lack of enforced sanctions, turning a blind eye to illicit Iranian oil exports throughout 2021, as well as having no clear plan to push back on the Islamic Republic in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett says lifting sanctions emboldens Iran. Lifting of sanctions and flooding this regime with billions of dollars means more rockets, more UAVs, more terror squads, more cyber attacks, more of everything. And not only against us, but also against our American allies in the region and other allies. Ben Talibu says the Biden administration is trying to leave the Middle East but that the Middle East won't leave the U.S. They're unaware that the Islamic Republic is not only looking to get America out, but to become the hegemon to fill the void, which may in fact create the groundwork for war that may drive the U.S. back in. Just days ago, Iran unveiled a long-range missile with a reported range of 1,440 kilometers or 900 miles, putting U.S. bases and Israel well within range. Meanwhile, more than 30 Senate Republicans sent a letter to President Biden demanding the Senate have a say over whether the U.S. rejoins the nuclear deal. The original nuclear agreement in 2015 did not receive Senate approval. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. I think the last group you want to negotiate with is the government in Iran. Uh, they are bent on destroying Israel. They're bent on destroying the United States. They call us the great Satan. Israel is the little Satan. Uh, why in the world would you ever go to a negotiating table with that group? It just makes no sense to me. The entire administration currently is trying this great reset. Let's go back to the Obama era. Uh, let's go back to those policies and whether it's reopening an embassy to the Palestinians in Jerusalem and, and, and to their surprise, finding out under international law, you can't do that without Israel's approval, uh, to now saying, let's take sanctions off of Iran, let's, let's release the pressure in hopes that we can come to some kind of peace deal and they won't develop a nuclear weapon. It just seems to be some kind of alternate reality where they are, are hoping to believe that these things can come true, but they're not looking it squarely in the face. Iran's a major sponsor, the major sponsor of terrorism in the region. They are funding Hezbollah. They are funding Hamas. They are delivering drones and missiles to Hamas. They are t t involved in drone attacks on their neighbors. Uh, they're running this proxy war against Saudi Arabia. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Why would you ever want to negotiate with them? In other news, hate crimes against the Jewish community in New York City are on the rise. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. The New York Police Department reports 15 hate crimes in January against Jewish people and their properties. That's more than triple the amount of attacks in January of 2021. And the violence is continuing into February with two assaults against Jewish men on the streets of Brooklyn over last weekend. This video shows a man running up behind one of the victims before punching him in the, in the head. Police are looking for the suspect. They're also seeking information on who might have spray painted swastikas 
on these yeshiva school buses. Well, turning now to the crisis in Ukraine, high-ranking Russian and Ukrainian officials are attending talks in Berlin seeking a diplomatic solution to avoid war, just as Russia begins 10 days of military drills today in neighboring Belarus. The Russian Defense Ministry released this video of S-400 missile systems arriving in the country. The Kremlin has also moved troops from Siberia and the Far East for the drills, adding to the 100,000 or more Russian troops already in the area. Meanwhile, President Biden has approved a plan for American troops in Poland to help thousands of U.S. citizens get out of Ukraine if Russia does invade. Some critics charge the administration is working to avoid a repeat of the chaotic pullout from Afghanistan. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki addressing those issues in Wednesday's press briefing. What people should understand is that the United States does not typically do mass evacuations. Of course, the situation in Afghanistan was unique for many reasons, including that it was the end of a 20-year war. We were bringing a war to an end. We were not trying to prevent a war, as we are certainly in this case. There are a range of means that individuals and Americans can depart from Ukraine, and we've been encouraging them to do exactly that. In October, the administration estimated some 6,600 Americans were living in Ukraine. Well, here at home, the latest inflation report from the government today shows consumer prices rising at the fastest rate since 1982. The year-over-year -year inflation rate came in at 7.5 percent, and the monthly rate in January was six-tenths of 1 percent. Both of those numbers were above economists' expectations and may increase pressure on the Federal Reserve to start raising interest rates. Well, ticket prices for this Sunday Super Bowl between the Los Angeles Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals are reaching new heights. KTLA in Los Angeles reporting on Monday, Ticketmaster listing its cheapest seats at $4,500 and the highest price seats, $55,000. Well, one Christian ministry is using the big game to highlight outstanding character and leadership in sports. The annual Super Bowl breakfast features the presentation of the Bart Starr Award. CBN's Charlene Aaron recently spoke with last year's winner, Demario Davis, about his faith. The annual Super Bowl breakfast is where faith and football meet. Sponsored by Athletes in Action, the outreach has taken place each year since 1988 drawing sellout crowds to hear some of the sports' biggest names. Names like DeMario Davis of the New Orleans Saints, known for his faith as well as big plays on the field. Ever since we came in, in the league, uh, we, we, we learned about the Super Bowl breakfast and um, saw that it wasn't just about the game, but it reflected um, a life of faith, a life of family, and of football. Highlights of the outreach include messages of hope, complete with a presentation of the gospel. Davis, a 10-year NFL veteran and all-pro linebacker, received last year's Bart Starr Award. It's a huge honor and um, uh, a privilege just to be celebrated, you know, by my pre my peers, uh, my coaches, and, and, and so many that are... Uh, critical and um, such a heavy part of the game. So to, to receive those accolades means a lot. But I think for me, it, it's all um, just reflective of, of the kingdom, you know, and, and, you know, everything that I do is about being a light for the kingdom. I just want to hear well done, my good and faithful servant. Davis's wife, Tamala, says her husband's faith inspires her and their family. One of the things that I just admire is how I constantly just see him seeking God, not just for one thing, but, you know, in every area of his life, you know, for how he's going out on the mission field, for how he um, strives to serve our family. Every day I, I watch him get up and, and read his Bible. In 2019, Davis saw the cost of his faith when the NFL fined him $7,000 for wearing a headband that said man of God under his helmet. While the NFL eventually backed down, public support for Davis helped create a man of God movement. Using the publicity, he sold man of God headbands to raise money for a local hospital. Davis felt it was important to handle the incident in a way that honored God. I didn't want it to be a situation where I wanted to be breaking the rules because the word tells us to submit to authority. But at the same time, I didn't want it to, to seem as I was hiding and mm -hmm. I was just going to bow down to, to, to the lead policy and, and be ashamed of my faith. A faith this lineman attempts to live out every season. When you just trust God and you lean into him, he'll make everything else work out the way that it's supposed to. That doesn't always mean it's going to 
be hunky dory and it's always going to work out nice and right. you're always going to have you know this <laughs> this amazing you know uh, uh award winning you know type of thing happen but it just means it's going to work out in your favor in the mm -hmm. end charlene aaron cbn news an encouraging testimony. Gordon, it seems fitting that he plays for a team called the Saints. He is a saint. It's amazing where you find saints. I mean, you never would expect to find a saint in the linebacker core, but here he is. You can watch the one-hour Super Bowl breakfast featuring the Bart Star Award, this year's Bart Star Award, on the CBN News Channel and the CBN News app. It's this Saturday and Sunday. All you have to do is visit CBNNews.com to find the time. For decades, the number of megachurches in America has been on the rise. Well, now that's changing. COVID has transformed the way Christians worship, including the size of congregations. CBN's Wendy Griffith looks at the growing trend of many churches. And crown him Lord of all. It's Sunday morning at Blackwater Baptist Church in Virginia Beach a country church that dates back to 1774. Although small to begin with, the pandemic has driven down the number of people in the pews. I think we had about 100, 110 coming, and now I think today there was like 68, 70, so somewhere around 30%, maybe a little more. Senior Pastor Lynn Hardaway says they felt the need for quick changes to keep the church going. We did some outside services, parking lot services, They've changed the way they do communion, the way they take offerings, no more passing things between people. Raised in the likeness of the resurrection. Congratulations. Last summer, they even borrowed a circular horse trough for outdoor baptisms, held Bible studies under the trees, featured an outdoor movie night, and like most churches, turned to live streaming services for those not attending in person. Our folks learned how to to Facebook and how to uh, do social media. I was very proud, especially of the elderly people, that they took on the challenge. Today, about 380,000 churches dot America's landscape. Of that number, only some 1,500 are considered mega churches that average 2,000 or more each weekend. The majority, however, are about the size of Blackwater Baptist or smaller. And according to a Faith Communities Today study, half of U.S. congregations have 65 people or fewer. So that lets you know that God's people prefer, by and large, smaller settings. Let God break into your life so you can have part of his glory. Let God shake. Please stand up on your feet. Hallelujah. Pastor Moses Asamoa of Living Destiny, a small church in Norfolk, Virginia, agrees. The isolation caused by COVID is creating a hunger for intimacy. Somebody actually joined us because they were looking for that place where they could actually walk with their pastor and know the people in the congregation. So the mega church has its place, but there's a desire to be actually hands-on. Unfortunately, the pandemic has caused many smaller churches to close their doors, while others are barely clinging to life. That's not the case, though, at Living Destiny. Pastor Asamoa says despite moving mainly to online services, especially during 2020, they have thrived and even bought a new building. We actually saved more money during COVID than, than ever before. I mean, it was, it, it's amazing because salaries did not change. The rent did not change. So maybe we saved a few dollars on water and electricity because people were not in the building that much. But the main bills of the church remained the same. And so to be able to save that much was, was just God. Pastor Asamoa believes prayer led to their success. The amazing thing is that our theme for the year 2020 was it was our year of the secret place based on Psalm 91. And so in March, when it hit, it was like, this makes sense. This is our year to just abide in God's presence. And so the church did well. I mean, because we stood upon the word of God, right? because God had prepared us up until that time. Pastor Asamoah's wife, Dalali, says the church's women's ministry also grew stronger. When it went on Zoom, you know, this is where the young people thrive. They love the technology. What happened was I was able to merge the women's ministry with the young adult ladies, and it, it was amazing. No matter what the devil does, no matter what 
assaults he makes on the church, God always wins. God In addition wins. to pastoring Blackwater Baptist, Lynn Hardaway oversees nearly 100 mostly small churches as part of the Bridge Network. He knows how challenging the pandemic has been. Pastors are struggling emotionally with having lost so many members and not sure how to get them back. And some have died. Some of the members that they've loved have died from COVID or suffered through it. And I know everyone in the nation has a sense of this, but pastors especially, because we're people pleasers by nature, and there's no way we can please people right now. There's too many different ideas, mask or no mask, vaccination or no vaccination. And so it's it has affected the, the pastors. Some of them are retiring. Some of them are just getting out of ministry. And according to church growth expert Tom Rayner, 90% of those watching live stream services at the beginning of the pandemic have dropped off. So now they're not attending church and, and they're not watching Facebook. Now they may be catching one of the TV pastors, mm -hmm. but we don't know. Hardaway worries that those who choose not to attend in person may be in danger of losing other, even more important Christian disciplines. Like prayer and reading the scriptures and fasting or whatever disciplines you're doing. So I would say it's important to be around other Christians who are facing the same things that you're facing. It just doesn't happen if you stay at home. As for the future, Hardaway believes the smaller church will continue to appeal to those who want to be close, intimate, and known. And maybe since COVID has isolated so many, as people begin to emerge and reconnect, they'll be looking for that smaller congregation to call their church home. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Virginia Beach. Well, let me underline what Pastor Hardaway said. When, when the enemy comes in, God always wins. So whether it's, uh, we, we've got to huddle together in catacombs, and when you've ever been to the catacombs in Rome, you realize how tight those spaces are. So you're talking about very small groups, but there are paintings in there celebrating the Eucharist. Go to uh, China just in the last hundred years, Watchman Nee pioneering something called a house church movement. At that point in time, he had one of the largest churches in China, I've been to the building. We would consider it a medium size, but he could he could hold hundreds of people there. But he said, no, we, we have to prepare for the years of ahead. And so he started house churches as a way to, to sort of live through the persecution. Uh, the church always thrives, but we have to realize we're the church. When two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. These are the words of Jesus. Let me give you a sermon illustration. If you've ever built a fire and you see the embers glowing in that fire, take one of them out and just put it on its own uh, away from the other embers and you'll see what happens. Pretty quickly, that ember is going to die out. The flame is going to leave it. When you put it back in with the other embers, it'll burst back into life, but on its own, it's not going to make it. It's not going to continue to burn. In these times, uh, can we gather? Can we go to church? Can we have church online? Can we have church other ways? Realize, don't forsake the gathering together. It's in fellowship with other believers that you really burst into flame. Keep that thought in mind and keep burning. Sports writer David Johnson was tested for COVID under a tailgating tent. The next week, he told his daughter, I think I'm dying. Doctors told his wife to plan his funeral and then pull the plug. What she did instead saved his life. She explained to me that within an hour I would expire if I didn't allow myself to be ventilated. And I said, no, I'm not because I had looked at the statistics and at the time, six out of seven COVID patients going on the ventilator were not ever coming off. In March, 2020, David Johnson, a sports writer who covers Ole Miss football for CBS Sports, attended a conference in Nashville. While he was there, he began to notice something odd. I had my family with me 
ate in a, a very good restaurant by reputation in Nashville. And I remember leaving there and my wife and I talking about, that was the worst meal we ever had. Had no taste to it. David returned to Oxford, Mississippi and began to feel ill. The breathing starts to become an issue. The coughing, the wheezing becomes an issue. So I decide that I need to go get tested for this coronavirus. And I was tested outdoors in an alley behind the clinic under a tailgating tent in, uh, in the middle of a thunderstorm. David's test was positive. He was admitted to the Baptist Memorial Hospital in Oxford. The next week, his condition began deteriorating quickly. So I called my oldest daughter, Sydney, who is a senior at Ole Miss, and I told Sydney, I said, I can't breathe, something's going on. So I told Sydney over and over, I think I'm dying. Later, a nurse told him he would have to be intubated. Pulled my family up on a tablet, so I was able to talk to them via Zoom, and they convinced me to go ahead and be ventilated. His wife, Ashley, and daughter also tested positive. However, their symptoms were not severe. We were uh, in quarantine for 21 days. So I prayed, prayed that I, I knew I had to, I had to be there for my children. So it was, it was very hard. That night, David lost consciousness. So day eight comes along and they tell me, David has 20% chance of making it off the vent. And, you know, thank God for that 20. We were just going to hang on to that 20% and just keep praying. Around day 10, David's liver and kidneys began failing. At one point, one of the doctors told Ashley to think about planning his funeral. They told me to go ahead and just pull the plug, take him off the vent. And I told them, no, I believed in miracles. And my husband was a fighter. And I was not going to get between God and my husband. Ashley began contacting friends and family around Oxford, asking them to pray. She also set up a Facebook page. On Palm Sunday of that week, David's pastor told the congregation to pray for him. I want us to pray believing with no doubt for healing for a guy named David Johnson, a local guy that means so much to us. The next day, doctors were surprised to see David's vitals begin to improve. On Palm Sunday, when they told me he had improved for 48 straight hours. And from then on, it was just, we were coming uphill and he was doing better, a little bit better every day. And then the next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And they call me and say, I think we're gonna take him off the vent tomorrow. After 46 days, he was released from the hospital COVID free. His brush with death changed David forever. I was prayed out of there, and I don't, I don't know why God chose to spare me. He left air in my lungs so that I can tell this story, that we get up every morning with the most powerful weapon in the universe, and that's our ability to pray directly to our Lord and Savior, and He hears us. I talked to every doctor who worked on my case, looking for a medical explanation for how I recovered. I, I've received nothing but blank stares in terms of a medical explanation. Since then, he's made a near full recovery and is once again covering Ole Miss football. And he believes in the power of prayer more than ever. We can pray while we're walking down the street. We can pray while we're driving down the interstate. He takes our call every time. And it may not always be the answer that we're looking for, we must accept his will and, and live life as best as we possibly can. We're closer as a family. We're closer to God. And, and I truly believe this experience that I went through and that my family went through was God showing me and arming me with a story that I can share with the world about the power of prayer. You can have your own story about the power of prayer. All you have to do is stand and believe. Isn't that incredible? You can have miracles in your life. Now, what are you supposed to believe? Well, believe the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in heaven, 
Is anybody on a respirator? Does anybody have COVID? Is anybody in pain? Is anyone crying? All of these things are illegal in heaven. It's just not allowed. It's not permitted. It's not God's will. So, as believers in Jesus Christ, we, isn't that incredible? We, you and I, are empowered to bring God's will to earth. It's wonderful. You don't have to sit back and say, well, God's sovereign. If he wants to move, he can move. No, you're the active agent. You are the vessel of faith to bring God's heaven to earth. That is wonderful. We get to do it. We get to initiate it. We get to pray for it. He gets to fulfill it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Rest in that. It's not based on how much you fast. It's not based on how well you pray. It's all based on your belief and announcing your belief to the situation you're in. When you believe that God's heaven can come into your life, that's when you can get the miracle. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. Before we pray, we've got some other reports. Here's Jeanette from Virginia. She had arthritis pain in her right hand for 14 years. Arthritis had spread to her shoulder, her foot, making her life miserable and painful. Jeanette was watching the 700 Club January 25th this year, just last month. Heard Terry say, someone else, you have arthritis in your hand so badly. God is healing you. Don't worry about how your fingers are twisted or how they look. Just receive healing. And then just receive healing and freedom from pain. Well, then I followed saying, someone else with arthritis in both of your hands, do what you could not do before. Receive healing into it now. Not only are Jeanette's hands free of arthritic pain, she is no longer has any pain at all, uh, which is just like heaven. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations and praise God. Well, here's one. This is Pat who came in by email, said, I was surfing TV channels for a different kind of news show to watch. As a Christian, I was familiar with the 700 Club and decided to watch. Gordon Robertson said, if anyone wants healing, place your hand where you want to be healed. I'm a hiker and had been having problems with my knees, so my hands went immediately to my knees. Then Gordon said that there was someone with both hands on their knees and God was healing the arthritis in both knees. Well, I went into shock. I just sat there for several minutes with a rush of disbelieving thoughts. Finally, I decided there was one way to find out. I went to the gym and walked on the treadmill without braces, no problem. The next day, I went for a five-mile hike. I have walked for over a month now, and the arthritis in my knees is gone. Thank you, Jesus. All right. If you're, if you're plagued with a flood of disbelieving thoughts, just go ahead and let them flood on through yep. and then see them on their way. And now look to Jesus, the author, the finisher of your faith the one who says, you are my redeemed. You are the one I came for. I left the 99 searching for you. I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want my will to be done in your life. Receive that. The Bible says when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So, in an act of faith, faith is always an act. It can be a noun, but in the Bible, it's also a verb. So, put your faith into action. Lay a hand on that area of the body that needs healing. If it's throughout your body, lay your hand on your head. If you can't reach it, that's okay. Lay your hand on your chest. Let's just believe God for you, that the kingdom of God would come to you. The will of God would be done in your body now. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we come to you. We come to you believing. We come to you confessing that by your stripes, we were healed. We are healed. We will walk continuously in your healing, in your anointing, in your forgiveness, in your redemption. The blood of Jesus Christ covers me. He has been sacrificed. Mm -hmm for me. I receive it. And now, 
I, I speak out loud to my body. Kingdom of heaven come. Will of God be done in my body now. Over the area I'm laying my hands, I say out loud, be healed and be made whole in Jesus' name. And now I receive it, what I couldn't do before. In faith, I do it now because Jesus has healed me. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, there's some, your name is Candace. I really don't know your condition. Nobody else does either. You know that you have an issue and you haven't told anyone. Your name came immediately. Jesus is healing you. Just lift up your hands and receive it and go your way praising him. You've been healed in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you heard the story of, of the man laying both hands on both knees and you're laying both hands on both knees and your knees are healed right now. You just felt like a cold wave, uh, numbing wave go through it. That's God restoring those joints right now. What you couldn't do before, realize you can walk now with no pain, get up, and walk. Uh, there's a woman, your name is Clarice, and you have recurring uh, bleeding uh, uterus, and um, uh, God's just doing a whole makeover for you, and He's restoring you right now. That's never going to happen again. You're, you're, going, you're relieved of it. It's, it's, it's gone from you right now, in Jesus' name. Yes, yeah, someone else, you have fibromyalgia, just kind of a chronic achy pain throughout your body and it can come and go in waves you, and it, it saps your energy. You're being completely set free from that though you've had it for some time. Just receive that freedom now in Jesus' name. The pain is gone, the healing is complete. Uh, there, there are many women who are, who are crying out for um, uh, children and you've got various problems where um, you, whether it's ovarian cysts or problems with fallopian tubes, problems with your uterus. God's healing you. He's giving you the power to create life. Thank you, Jesus. What he intended for you, that you would have generations. He is giving that to you. Just like Hannah, your heart cry has been heard in the throne room. He is giving you the power to give life in Jesus' name. Someone, can I just say there are others that are suffering from depression and the, the, the oil of joy for mourning is coming over you right now. It is gone, that veil, that darkness. Just rejoice in the Lord and what he's doing in your heart and in your life right now. You've been set free from that. In Jesus' name, receive the light of Christ. Uh, someone, you've had blinding headaches. Uh, uh, they're like cluster migraines. Uh, God is, is healing you of all of that and everything associated with your brain, mental function, all of the uh, things that should fire normally are now going to fire normally for you. And all that blood constriction, all of those other problems from this, all going away right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the miracles that you do, for you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we receive you, we receive the answer to every need. Thank you for it. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Share your good report. 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we want to stand with you in prayer. We believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that doesn't give up but continues on until you get the answer. If that's you and you want someone to pray with you, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. U.S. Olympic athletes won three gold medals at the 2022 Winter Games Wednesday. America's Nathan Chen took the men's single skate, scoring 22 points higher than the next closest competitor. In the women's half pipe, Chloe Kim won gold, a repeat of her 2018 performance. And Lindsay Jacob Ellis finally taking home the gold medal in the women's snowboard cross. 
16 years after a blunder at the Turin Games cost her the win. The Olympic Committee is holding up the medal ceremony in the team figure skating competition where the Russian team beat the United States and Japan. After an official initially cited a legal issue for the delay, a Russian skater reportedly tested positive for a banned substance. Well, Cincinnati Bengals fans will probably enjoy this next story. A zoo in northeast India just welcomed two Royal Banger, Bengal Tiger Cubs into the world. The newest cubs have yet to be named. Zookeepers say the mother and her babies are doing well. This isn't the first time mom, Kazi, made news with new cubs. Back in 2020, she gave birth to babies Sultan and Suresh. Some fans of the Cincinnati Bengals might see the timing as providential with the upcoming Super Bowl this weekend. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. That will never happen. Those four words from his first grade teacher dashed Michael Phillips' dream of becoming a lawyer. Those words also shut down Michael's dreams altogether and started him on a path of self-destruction. Author and pastor Michael Phillips is an advocate for social justice and education reform. Yet because of his early struggles with the criminal justice system, he almost became just another statistic. After a series of devastating losses in his life, Michael abandoned his faith and turned to dealing drugs. He was arrested and faced the possibility of years in prison until a judge gave him a second chance. In Michael's book, Wrong Lanes Have Right Turns, he shares his incredible story of escape from the school to prison pipeline and encourages others to embrace their God-given purpose to change lives and revitalize communities. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Michael Phillips. Michael, it's wonderful to have you with us. Oh, I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you for having me. You know, children are so innocent, and we all begin dreaming when we're very young about life and what we'd like to be. Take us back to that first grade classroom. How did a remark by your teacher shut your dreams down? Uh, yeah, just like uh, any child having uh, great dreams of becoming uh, something that they aspire to be, I had those dreams. And in first grade, uh, which is far too early, uh, those dreams were crushed by the words that will never happen. My first grade teacher told me it was impossible for me to become a lawyer. Um, the sad thing about that is that when I uh, decided to uh, talk back, if you will, <laughs> and suggest that it is possible for me to become a lawyer because my grandmother told me I could, my mother told me I could, my father told me I could, uh, I was almost suspended uh, for uh, standing up for myself and believing uh, in the dreams that were in my heart. That was the beginning of many attacks on you as a child, on your faith. You saw, you had your dreams squelched at six. You saw a murder happen right in front of you at 10. At 12, your dad died. Uh, your father's death had, as you would expect, tremendous impact on you. You began delivering drugs on the street. Why did you also turn against God? Well, there was no explanation for my father's death. Uh, you know, at a tender age of 12 years old, uh, at his funeral, the preacher gets up and says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And those words sank in my heart as if God was the culprit in the death of my father. Uh, no one simply told me that my dad's health was poor and that, you know, he didn't take care of his, his, his body and he was overweight and he had hypertension and all these factors that contributed to his heart attack. But they simply uh, put it on God. And at 12, I couldn't understand that. And there was no context to those words. If the preacher would have said, this is Job trying to reconcile loss in his life instead of putting the words of Job in God's mouth, then maybe perhaps I would not have become so angry. But that anger towards God and towards faith uh, was the result of losing my father because he was, he was my hero. So I didn't want anything to do with church, anything to do with God. A basketball scholarship became your ticket to college and to moving out of a, an area that you were raised in that for many, in many ways challenged your opportunity and who you were, then that opportunity was ripped away from you. Talk about that. Yeah, I came home for, you know, not even a semester in, into college. Uh, you know, I came home for a weekend visit, just excited about the fact that 
I had arrived to where I had arrived to, that I made it through all of that trauma, you know, because often when trauma goes unacknowledged, tragedy goes uninterrupted. And the fact that I made it to this point was amazing. And so I went home for a weekend visit and uh, went out with some friends. And early in the wee hours of the morning, the uh, gentleman that was driving me fell asleep behind the wheel. And uh, we had a horrific car accident. The lower half of my body was caught underneath the dash of the car, and the upper half, the upper torso of my body, went through the windshield. So half of my body's in the car, half of my body's out of the car, and completely crushed the right side of my leg, uh, broken tibula, fibula, a few bones in my foot. Uh, I woke up in the hospital when I became conscious, and the report was that I would never walk again and certainly never play uh, sports again. Yeah, you were you were in a hard place there, and... Again, you went back to what had become a familiar way for you to handle disappointment and discouragement and loss in your life. You started dealing in drugs again and a number of other things. Finally, you were arrested. You faced actually 30 years in prison, but a door opened unexpectedly and you got a second chance. Tell us about that. Yeah, I thought my destiny was going to be written on those center block walls and that my purpose was going to be paved on those concrete floors. Uh, the moment they shut that uh, jail cell, uh, I thought it was over, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, on a Sunday of all days, and if you have any dealings with the criminal justice system, you know this doesn't happen, but on a Sunday of all days, um, the correctional officer came to get me out of my cell after serving six months of pretrial detention. Uh, and they put me in a van and took me to a federal building and sat me before a judge. Uh, and the judge uh, simply said, son, you have an option. You can either go to jail or you could go to school. And uh, certainly uh, I look right back at him and said, sir, I'll, I'll, choose, I'll choose college. Uh, and they shipped me off to uh, Old Roberts University in a program at that time uh, called Give Me a Chance. And um, it, I believe it was ran by a man by the name of Bill Owens. And they allowed me to go to college instead of to go to prison. And it changed my life forever. Yeah, your story is such a picture of redemption. You were given that second chance, and still, even at ORU, you continued selling drugs until you attended Spring Revival. Tell us what happened to you there. Yeah, you know, you really can't be restored until you know you are forgiven. And for so long, I carried the pain and the trauma of, of all of my past troubles and I wasn't able to transform that pain, only transmit that pain. And so at ORU, they had a uh, spring revival, which was mandatory. You had to attend. And I really didn't want to feel God's presence. I, I grew up in church. I knew what God's presence was, and I didn't want to feel it. So for the first time in my life, I actually decided to actually smoke some marijuana. Um, and I, I got as high as I could off of it um, and drank as much as I could without stumbling. And I went to church in that posture. And uh, I sat, they sat me on the third row in this revival and started to sing How Great Thou Art. And in a matter of seconds, I was sober completely. And all that pain and all that frustration was gone from my life. And I was in God's presence. And it terrified me so much that I literally ran out of the chapel uh, with all those thousands of people up the middle aisle and ran back to my dorm room just to escape God's presence. But I couldn't get away. He followed me uh, right to that room. And I had an encounter with God there. You did for three days. You know, we're, uh, we're out of time, Michael. I'm frustrated because people need to read the book because there's so much more <laughs> than just what we've talked yes. about. And you talk in the yes. book so much about the power of purpose in the lives yes. of people, knowing what your purpose is, and it's worthy of it. Also, I want to say, if you're somebody who wants to understand, have a better, better understanding of some of the racial divide that exists in our country, you need to read this book. The book is called Wrong Lanes Have Right turns and it is available wherever books are sold. Michael Phillips, thank you. Wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Great to be here. God bless you. Gordon. In Irving, Texas, nearly all the pantries that helped feed the community over the last two years have closed down. Still, there are hundreds of people that need groceries and supplies. Well, thanks to Operation Blessing, one pantry is able to keep its doors open and provide that much needed help. While some parts of the country are getting back to normal, many families still rely on their local food bank. In Irving, Texas, 
Operation Blessing Partner Agape Connect is doing all they can to help families cope with the pandemic. A lot of people doing COVID are really still struggling. When COVID hit my job, I had lost my job as well, but Operation Blessing helped me during my challenging times during COVID just by having the necessary things that I needed. Executive Director, Harrison Hernandez. So our average is about two, 300 vehicles per distribution. So we might end up seeing anywhere from 400 to 600 plus uh, individuals come through our line. Families that are still hurting financially, families that are still being impacted because of what COVID has done to us. I'm Mary, I uh, got two kids. I've been in that position before. I um, choose to either feed my family or pay my bills. Thanks to Operation Blessing Partners, families are getting the help they need to feed their children. At many distribution sites, people drive through and have food placed directly into their cars. While all the pantries shut down, mostly in Irving, our church stayed open because we still had resources that we could provide to our community. And we wouldn't be able to serve Agape, wouldn't be able to be where it is today without the help and the support of folks at Operation Blessing. Thank you, Operation Blessing, for being there, providing me and my family some food, especially the kids. They do greatly appreciate it. We thank you for everything. That thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. Join with everything we're doing around the world. A portion of every gift you give goes into the work of Operation Blessing. You help people with fresh water, you help people with special surgeries, you help people with livelihood programs, you help people in disaster relief, and you help feed hungry people right here in America with millions of pounds of food every single year. You're a part of all of it when you join with us. Now, how much is it to join? It's just $20 a month. Some of you can give at a higher level. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. Whatever level, when you call and join, I've got something for you. I want you to have it. It's my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit. Let me underline in the title, In You. This is an instruction manual for you, how you can get guidance from the Holy Spirit in your everyday life. It's wonderful. It will release the gifts of the Spirit in your life. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join. 1-800-700-7000. I think we have time for a we question. Do. Okay, this is Myrna, and she writes in and says, in the Apostles' Creed, what does he descended into hell mean? Oh, great. Thank you. I, I got, <laughs> you got one, a minute, one minute oh. to explain the <laughs> Apostles' Creed. Uh, there are a, a bunch of verses. One, one uh, Ephesians uh, is chapter 4. Uh, he descended into the depths of the earth. And then in 1 Peter, there's two references, one in chapter 3, where he, he proclaims to the spirits in prison. And then in chapter 4, it's very explicit. He proclaimed, he preached the gospel to the dead. So the, in the first century, uh, in the first centuries of, of Christianity, there was a cr critique. What about the people that died before Jesus uh, rose from the dead? How did they get saved? And so the Apostles' Creed is an answer to that based on these scriptures, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. Uh, what happened to Jesus on Saturday is a, a big question. And uh, there's some spiritual guidance, but that's where the Apostle Creed uh, gets that he, he went to hell. And then came Sunday. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we emphasize. Amen. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you.